Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Dr. Stacey Pettyjohn, the Director of the Defense Program here at the Center for a New American Security. Joining me here today at the virtual CNAS fireside is the United Kingdom's Minister of State for the Armed Forces, the Right Honorable James Heapy. Welcome, thank you for being here. We're so glad you were able to make time on your visit for DC to stop by. There's been some recent interesting announcements about support to Ukraine, and um, we also wanna hit on the integrated review refresh. Um, before we get into all that substance though, a couple of administrative notes. Um, this is a public conversation that will be recorded and available on our website after the fact. We would encourage you and the audience to uh, uh, share your questions for the minister. Um, I will introduce them throughout our conversation, but you need to make sure to identify yourself. We don't take anonymous questions. So let's dive in um, and turn right to Ukraine since that's been all over the headlines. Um, I've heard from the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson that he has said that the best way to increase the security of Europe is by defeating Russia and Ukraine. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah. I, I think that there is, there is an outrage that's been committed in Europe in the last year, which is that you know, Russia has invaded its sovereign, independent neighbor, and it is impossible to see how the security situation in Europe is, uh, is, is, is left in a sort of tolerable state if we, if we don't do anything but give the Ukrainians the means to end this on their terms. You know, I just think you can, people who sort of say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's all too difficult, it's all too expensive, it's causing huge cost of living pressures, not only around Europe, but around the world. It is, um, it is driving up food prices in the developing world, even the supply of food in the developing world. Just call cool time, everybody sticks to what they've got, and let's move on. Well, that is to basically say to anybody who has an ambition on invading their neighbor, that if you can tough it out for a year, take the international sanctions and the opprobrium and the pariahdom that comes with that sort of behavior for just 12 months, at the end of it, you get to bank whatever you've gained in the meantime. And that clearly cannot be the way that you double down on a rules-based international system and a belief in the sort of values of freedom, territorial integrity, sovereignty. So no, I think that the, the stakes are much higher than just the recovery of Ukrainian territory. This is about the world we want to live in for the next 30, 40, 50 years, and thus giving Ukraine what it needs to end this on terms that are agreeable to them and them alone is surely the right thing to be doing. I'd agree that the stakes are much larger. It's uh, like going back to the 1991 uh, war against Iraq, where again, it's establishing that no, this is not acceptable. You cannot aggrandize yourself through territorial aggression. Um, so the big news yesterday was the surprise visit of Ukrainian President Zelensky to London and where your prime minister announced that uh, you're gonna begin training Ukrainian pilots on Western fighter jets and providing them with some more material support in anticipation of a uh, Russian spring offensive. So um, the training seems to be another example uh, of where your country is in the forefront and sort of pushing the bounds of what's acceptable in terms of providing the Ukrainians. You were the first to give them anti-tank weapons, you gave them the Challenger tanks, um, and so this seems to be leading towards potentially Ukraine getting Western fighter jets, which President Zelensky made the impassioned plea for, saying that we have freedom, um, we need the wings to defend it, I think, or to protect it. So do you see your country providing fighter jets soon, and do you think that this will be an actual uh, significant combat capability for the Ukrainians, or is it more a uh, politically symbolic gesture that is breaking down the existing obstacles that exist to other countries within NATO? Um, so uh, it is, it's, uh, really it's none of those things first up. It is, you know, uh, at the end of the war, Ukraine will almost certainly uh, need to rebuild across the piece, but within its military, it will need to rebuild. And 
very obviously that rebuilding will probably be through the procurement or gifting of large amounts of NATO caliber kit. And, uh, and so a conversation was had with the Ukrainians about uh, you know, the state of their air force and what they had got in terms of trained pilots that you know, might be um, more than they need given the number of planes that they've got remaining in service. And so an opportunity presented itself to start training Ukrainian pilots uh, on the jets that they may have uh, as a post-war air force. Um, and that, that was the decision that we made. That was what was announced yesterday. Now, very obviously, you know, people, as you rightly noted in your question, Stacey, the UK has been the thought leader on a lot of gifting over the last 12 months. There are lots of thresholds that we've kind of led people through. And although, you know, I, 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 I blush a little when people say we've led the way because the US in terms of volume has led the way by an absolute mile, you know. Uh, but we may have been the first to give something and then others, most notably the US, have come in and given significant volumes. Um, if the consequence of the pilot training is that other options are available to our political leaders later in the year in response to um, you know, uh, another Russian escalation or outrage. And we have to be clear, you know, each time that a threshold has gone through, you know, my Secretary of State, Ben Wallace, has been very clear on this. You know, it, is, it, is the, it is the way the Russians prosecute this war that breaks the taboo. It's not the UK breaking the taboo. The UK simply is the first to respond to whatever outrage the Russians have committed. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, as the Prime Minister said last night, everything's on the table. But ostensibly, the training of pilots is not with any immediate commitment to donate jets. Okay. Um, it does make sense to uh, have the training precede the provision of the kit since you need to learn how to operate it and that has caused a lot of the delays, I think, for the Ukrainians on some of the more advanced systems that they've been uh, given by different countries, including the United States, like the Patriot or NASAMS or such. Um, yeah. So there were two other pieces to the announcement that uh, st uh, stuck out to me. And the first was the long range capability that was mentioned. And then the training, expanding the training that you have right now of Ukrainians as a part of Operation Interflex. Yes. Um, can you talk about both of those aspects of the support? So the longer range capability, we're, we're not going into the detail of exactly what that is, other than that it is a longer range capability. Um, and um, you know, Russia only has itself to blame for the fact that that is a donation that we're willing to make. The attacks on Ukrainian critical national infrastructure, the attack, which are a sort of an attack on the Ukrainian civilian population, uh, were unacceptable. And very obviously, you know, the Ukrainians need to be given what is necessary to defend themselves against those sorts of uh, of attack and longer range systems are required in order to get after the command and control nodes that are that are involved in the prosecution of those attacks. So, so that is the 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 the, the cause of uh, of that uh, increased ambition in terms of our donation of precision fires. Um, and as for the training mission, I mean, look, it is it is amazing to think that a year ago I was having conversations like these in which we were reflecting, you know. We were rather impressed at ourselves having trained 10,000 Ukrainians over the eight, hour, eight years previous. We trained 10,000 Ukrainians in the last six months, and this year we'll do even more. And we won't just do 10,000 or more Ukrainian recruits to the Ukrainian army. We'll start to train Marines as well. Um, there is a, uh, you know, the battle space in Ukraine involves um, a very significant uh, river obstacle with the Dnieper, and obviously the Ukrainians need a force that is capable of prosecuting an offensive that will need to uh, cross that sort of obstacle. Uh, there is uh, increasingly a coastal element to this, as very obviously the Ukrainians would uh, eventually seek to recover their territory and get back to the Sea of Azov. Um, and, and of course, there is the um, 
you know, what remains a very high Ukrainian priority, um, their ability to successfully defend Odessa and other key coastal sites that aren't uh, under Russian occupation. So that commitment to train Marines is, um, is very necessary, and the Royal Marines are very excited about the opportunity to join the British Army in, uh, in training their Ukrainian colleagues. That sounds great. Um, one of the, uh, I want to switch now gears a little bit and sort of pull the thread on the implications for some of the support to Ukraine to uh, British Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. Um, because this is one of the challenges that I know the Pentagon has faced in terms of um, wanting to provide as much support as they can to Ukraine, but then that has an impact on American forces readiness. And if we take, for example, the training of the Ukrainian pilots, I know the, R the RAF has um, had some challenges with respect to uh, meeting its own training requirements for British pilots. So how do you anticipate managing this uh, expanded sort of remit? Well, I mean, so it is true uh, that the military flying training system has not been running in the way that uh, I or any of my ministerial colleagues would like. And we've been putting a lot of pressure on the Royal Air Force and their contractors to resolve this, but it is an important distinction that the pilots that we have agreed to train from yesterday are trained combat air pilots. They are trained to fly fast jets already. So two thirds of that military flying pipeline that is not functioning in the way that we would want it to back home is irrelevant to the commitment we made yesterday. The bit that matters is the conversion to type and that part of the system is less constrained. Oh, that, that's good to know. Um, it, it's important to be mindful of the fact that pilot training in particular is something that takes years to yes. actually gain the proficiency yeah. needed. These, these, are not, these are not guys that until yesterday were fighting in trenches and infantry soldiers and that we're going to now train them from scratch to fly. These are already seasoned combat veterans who know how to fight in the sky a thousand miles an hour, um, which is you know, kind of the large part of the battle. What they need to do now is to learn to fly different types of plane. Um, and, uh, and so in theory, that conversion uh, can be quite quick. Now, the reality is, is that given that, as I stressed earlier on, this is not a decision to train with a, with a decision already made to gift jets. You know, Rishi said that all options are on the table, but we are definitely have not made any decision to do that uh, yet. So actually those pilots will then just, I would imagine, having done that initial conversion, will then fly as part of the Royal Air Force and continue to develop their skills. And if Ukraine needs them back to go and fly missions in whatever uh, planes Ukraine has, then obviously they are Ukraine's pilots. But that, you know, I think there's a sort of, I, I, I don't, I saw in the UK media some concern over what this meant for our own flying training pilots, and I don't think people need to worry given you know, how, how experienced these pilots already are. They're coming in at a part of the system that is less constrained. That's great. Um, so now let's turn to the Army, uh, which is also facing some uh, readiness challenges um, in terms of spare parts, stockpiles of munitions. Um, I've seen reports in the press that they, the Army has at most a couple of days worth of um, munitions if it were to be employed in combat. How are you balancing the needs of the British Army and Ukraine? Well, I think it's probably fair to say that we have in mind uh, what must be the irreducible minimum mm -hmm. to our stockpiles. Um, but uh, we've declined right from the outset to say what that irreducible minimum is for very obvious sure. national security reasons. Um, we have, and beyond that, we've been willing to basically consider gifting everything and anything in our ammo bunkers thereafter because we believe passionately that this is, you know, this is the biggest affront to security in the Euro-Atlantic definitely since the Balkans, but arguably since the Second World War, um, that this is, as we said in the, you know, in the, in, in the very uh, uh, opening answer to our discussion, 
this is about more than just the territorial integrity of Ukraine. This is about whether you're going to stand up for a rules-based international system in which this kind of, in which Russia's behaviour is unacceptable. And so, if you're clear that that's what's at stake, then it makes sense to sort of to to, to take a bit of risk. But two years ago, we did a review that focused uh, the employment of the British Armed Forces in a way that was geared around operating, you know, permanent presence all around the world, mm -hmm. deterring um, so you, you could be ahead of the moment of crisis that, you know, and there was a, and the theory went that by operating effectively, you could take a bit of risk against war fighting because you, you would, there wouldn't be the war, you'd have deterred it, you'd have got there first. Now, a lot of that military logic is is entirely sound, and I don't think that what we set out in the integrated operating concept is 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 out of date. I think it's still entirely relevant, and the way that we should do our peacetime business as usual. But you can't help but realise when you see a war being fought on your doorstep that if you that, that war fighting is still possible, that going to war with a peer requires lots of stockpiles, it requires lots of industrial resilience, and that, that, that your capacity to prosecute a war is not just about the stuff that lines up on the first day and however much supply they've got in their bunkers with them. It is about your ability to sustain it day after day after day, month after month, year after year. And we've realized that that in that sense, we're relatively hollow. So too are a lot of other NATO militaries, indeed, even the United States, with all of the money and vastness of your own armed forces, you too have realized that stockpiles, logistics, critical enablers need to be, need to be bolstered. Now, for you, that's a slightly shorter journey than it is for us, but that's what we've got to urgently get after because you know, our, the credibility of our conventional deterrence depends not on how many tanks you've got, how many planes you've got, how many ships you've got. It's the, it's the credibility of your ability to actually get those things into the fight and sustain them thereafter. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. We did some research at CNAS on um, munition stockpiles for our budget analysis, and it's clear that the U.S. has underinvested and that industry is not prepared to be able to rapidly surge in the way that we really would like it to And right it's now. really unsexy. I mean, yeah. as a politician, what you want to do is stand on a jetty next to a billion dollar destroyer or on a tank park in front of 200 brand new tanks. That's the photo you dream of as a defense minister, not standing there at the end of a production line going, oh, 10,000 shells a month. You know, that's a sort of, you know, that's kind of, you know, and, and so and it doesn't make headlines. You know, how many, how many thousands of rounds of 155 the UK produces in a year is only noteworthy because of the lessons we've learned in the last 12 months. Rewind two years, if I had stood up in the House of Commons or Ben Wallace had gone on TV and said, Pwah, huge announcement from defense, next year we're gonna manufacture 50,000 rounds of 155, literally nobody would have cared, tumbleweed. And so, so we just gotta, so you know, Ben and I joke that actually the sort of, the, the hallmark of success you know, in terms of what really needs to be done to make the UK Armed Forces a credible war fighting entity is that we need to deliver the most boring, unglamorous, unsexy defense command paper that there's ever been. But actually those, those railway low um, flatbed, you know, rolling stock, the, your, your trucks, your ammo bunkers, your logistics, your signals, your engineering, your theater enablement, all of that stuff, your critical enablers, strategic enablers, those are the things that bring credibility to whatever you have in your fighting echelons. I couldn't agree more, and they're actually the things that you can produce more of relatively quickly compared to a new ship or an aircraft. Mm. So it's an area where you can expand your capacity in the near term and that really ensure that you know, your tooth to tail ratio is not out of balance. Um, it's good you're advocating for that, and Secretary Wallace is. Um, we have you know, Bill LaPlante in the U.S. saying production's deterrence, and we really need to get back to that industrial sort of um, uh, base that's behind warfare and thinking about it as an industrial undertaking. Uh, do you mind if I, if I pick up on that? Because I think that one of the other things that the last year has shown is that 
war is not a defense endeavor. The job of the DOD, the MOD in London, MODs everywhere, is to design a force that gets you to the start line. But if you end up in a war of national survival, if you end up in the big war, it is a whole of government, whole of state endeavor to sustain yourself in that war yeah. thereafter. And the difficulty is that so many developed Western economies have offshored so much of their manufacturing, uh, have supply chains that are convoluted and global and thus exposed at time war. And you can't, we've come through the pandemic and the Ukraine war and seen what impact those sorts of global crises have on supply chains. So you have to look at that experience and learn the lessons that you need sovereign defense industrial complex. It is in your interests not to compete so aggressively in your defense exports that you, that you erode all of the defense industrial base of your allies in the process. Actually, you need your allies to have indented defense industrial bases of their own. You need to think about where in the world you're getting your critical minerals, your semiconductors, where in the world the supply chains are, are the sea lines of communication defendable that bring those things to the point of manufacture. And you know, it, it, is, it is not likely, given the, the costs of labor and everything else in our developed economies, that we will onshore the quantity of industry to be able to, process, to, to have the sovereign defense, the, the sovereign industrial base that's required. So actually accepting, and I think the US is getting after this through its mm -hmm. nearshoring um, policy, actually you've just got to accept that what you need is manufacturing base that isn't onshore, but is sufficiently nearby that it is credible to be repurposed in time of war to actually keep you sovereign and therefore going. Hit on a topic near and dear to my heart, Becca Wasser and I have a re new report on integrated turns with allies and partners, where we oh, talk uh, about a little bit about ally shoring and also uh, co-production, co-development. Yes. Um, so this is a cornerstone for of the U.S. national defense strategy. They say allies and partners are, and I've similarly heard CDS uh, Admiral Radigan talk yes. about trying to achieve interchangeability of forces. Um, what steps do you think need to be taken to uh, further integrate American and British forces and with other allies? Well, look, I mean, there are some really big eye-catching programs across all domains in which that integration is, is happening. Um, I think we have to be careful of big sort of Trojan horse type programs that seem superficially very attractive because the U.S. export price is very cheap but that can sometimes erode our own manufacturing base. Mm. To go back to my previous point, yeah. you know, it's not in the US's interest that uh, nobody else beyond the US can manufacture stuff. Um, so uh, you know, where there are opportunities to manufacture stuff together to our mutual advantage, let's do it. Where there are opportunities to share technology and to accelerate as pace as a group of trusted partners, let's do it, AUKUS being the most mm -hmm. obvious example where the most sensitive stuff around nuclear propulsion, but also hypersonics and other things are, you know, are, are, are things that the US, UK, Australia uh, are or may look to work together on. Um, but then so much of interoperability is not necessarily about a commonality of platform. It's about the commonality of the data, the, the data that flows between the platforms. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's fine for, the French to build Raphael and the Brits to build Typhoon or, or GCAP and for the US to build F-35, F-22 and whatever your future aircrafts will be. Um, what matters is that we build them in such a way where even at the very secret you know, um, level that those planes particularly operate, they are built right from the outset in a way that sees the, 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 the necessity of data transfer mid-mission between complementary but not identical systems. Yeah, you got to have that technical interoperability and communications sort of uh, infrastructure in place, but you also have to break down those barriers to information sharing that I think in some 100%. ways are uh, larger than the technical problems. Like how old-fashioned already from what we've seen in Russia, it, it, with Russia and Ukraine and our response there. And, you know, this incredible application of 
you, know, you take UK, US, Ukrainian intelligence, UK, US, Ukrainian science, UK, US, Ukrainian industrial innovation, UK, US, Ukrainian military cunning. And that is the spiral loop that's been working really effectively and it's brilliant. How old fashioned the things like NoFawn and ITAR and everything else feel when you've seen the power and the necessity of that spiral loop whirring away. And I would argue that once you're over the start line and you're into the war, it, the, what follows then is a technological game of cat and mouse. And so those spiral loops are actually the thing that gives you the edge. And we have to, we can't, we can't rip away, away all of that bureaucracy and process once the war has started. We have to make the policy now about the way that we allow science in the UK and the US and other trusted allies to flow freely, how we allow our industries to bounce off one another, how we share the intelligence that we gain, you know, and, and, and get our heads around what that means for competition law and all those sorts of things. We have to set ourselves to be able to spiral effectively. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're, we're, we're in this model where we've been able to the last couple decades with the wars in the Middle East and Central Asia, where we've been able to band-aid it and do it after the yes. fact and deconflict, and that won't work if you're going to face up here. In exactly the future. right, exactly. Um, I, we're, we're, I'm mindful we're running short on time. We're getting some good audience questions. Please keep them in. I want to make sure we talk a little bit about the integrated review and the tilt, but I, uh, before we get there, I want to um, turn to um, sort of Army force generation, which I know is um, sort of an area where there's been a lot of discussion because the Army is shrinking to a size that is unprecedented for several hundred years, at least my understanding, um, and working on becoming more deployable to support sort of the commitments around the globe. Um, but uh, NATO at the same time is developing a new force generation model and wants yeah. to have 300,000 very ready troops you already have a battle group in Estonia. Um, you know, what can the UK realistically contribute to NATO's sort of ground force requirements? Well, uh, a, a division uh, and a core headquarters, which is what we've been providing for, for decades and we will continue to, to provide. Um, the, you know, and, and it is worth stressing because I think it's often forgotten that a UK armoured brigade is very nearly twice the size in terms of people uh, of what the NATO ask is. Mm -hmm. A UK division uh, is very nearly twice the size of what the NATO ask is. And so, um, now, <laughs> believe me, I have plenty of conversations about, well, why on earth do we bother having a brigade that's twice the size of what's needed? But that's, <laughs> that's kind of what we... Um, you know, it, we, we don't design our force to meet the NATO requirement. We design our force to give ourselves the most effective army that that, that we think we, we, we can have. Um, I um, there is no doubt about it. Uh, ben and I have made no secret that the army's equipment is very out of date, and the army is in urgent need of recapitalisation. Um, and in fairness, there is 42 billion pounds worth of investment going into the army over the next 10 years. Um, and by anybody's standards, that's, that's a lot. It, it will be transformative. The problem is, and this is where NATO needs to show some thought leadership, and I, you know, I, I'm sure that it will, but do we want, in 2035, if, if, if you know, the UK has got a, a more urgent need to transform than than some other allies. But everything in the land domain feels very incremental at the moment. And so there is this real danger that we all keep replacing main battle tanks with slightly better main battle tanks, infantry fighting vehicles with slightly better you know, artillery pieces with slightly greater range or slightly mm -hmm. greater precision. But that rather ignores the scale of disruption that is already possible for that. I mean, the people talk about the sort of core battle space of being 100, 200 kilometers tops. Well, you know, one, in the age of hypersonics that can go 1,000 kilometers, the core battle space is half a continent wide. You know, it's a sort of, so I, I just, I, I don't want us to spend 42 billion pounds in 10 years and end up with an army that was good for 2025, but is already woefully out of date by the time it comes in service in 2035. So I think that 
the UK out of necessity is going to need to think about how we skip a couple of generations to land in the middle of the next decade with an army that is relevant for then. And I think NATO needs to embrace that requirement too and start to signpost to NATO armies that what it wants in 2035 is not X tanks, X infantry fighting vehicles. It may well need all sorts of other things that we don't really fully understand yet, but we just need to start articulating quite urgently. Yeah, it's really difficult. Uh problem when you look at time frames and managing the current requirements with the likely future ones and the uncertainty with technology changing so quickly, not just hypersonics, like cheap drones, basically cruise missiles that are being used that are, can reach all of Ukraine right now that Russia is using. There's a, lot, there's a lot that's happening and needs to be considered there. So we have a bunch of audience questions um, from Paul, Rachel, Michael um, that all hit on a topic that I wanted to turn to next, which was the integrated review had the tilt to the Pacific, but this was obviously done before um, Russia invaded Ukraine mm -hmm. last year. Um, and so Paul had asked what you think should be the number one focus, the region for the UK, is it you know the Europe or is it Asia? And Rachel had asked, um, because the United States is focused on the Indo-Pacific, what would the UK do if there were a conflict in China? Would they backfill the US and Europe or elsewhere around the globe, or would they join the fight in the Indo-Pacific? So the answer to Paul's question is Europe. The answer to Rachel's question is, I find it impossible to imagine that we wouldn't be there. And I just don't think that that's mutually exclusive. I think that as a European power, very obviously, geography requires that our pacing threat, our main effort, the thing that drives our force design is the threat that could be existential for the UK, and that is, that is Russia. And so that's the, that's the priority. Even under the IR refresh, that's the priority. But implicit in so much of what we do with the, with the United States is that if the United States is to remain committed to Euro-Atlantic security, mm -hmm. Euro European powers with global reach need to be ready to come to the Pacific and be with the US there. And very obviously that's a cap that fits the UK, it fits France, Germany, Dutch. Um, and and I, I think that's, that's a fair trade. You know, I mean, and, and, it, and it's not just a sense of kind of brotherly loyalty to our American, uh, to, our, to, to the US. It is um, you know, the, the, the UK's economic future is increasingly on the part of the world where the global economy is growing fastest, and that is Southeast Asia. Um, and if we want to, if we want to trade more with ASEAN and others in that region, we have to understand that with that comes responsibility to play a part in the global, in, in the regional security architecture as well. So there's a sort of a, there's a, there's an obligation that comes alongside our increased ambition to trade in the region. There is an obligation that comes because the US remains committed to our security in Europe, so we should be committed to yours in the Pacific. There's also the fact that, you know, uh, that after the US is our best friend in the world, Australia and France are probably the next, uh, and the Aussies are part of that thing in the Pacific too. So I just, for all those reasons, we have to be ready to, to come down there, but geography requires that Europe is the first priority. That makes a lot of sense. It's really hard though when you see like 2021 with the deployment of the carrier strike group was yeah. this powerful symbol that exercises with all the different nations. And I think that's important, but I also know that that was a huge uh, request of the Royal Navy and that it's not something they can do every day. And no, but, but nor should it be. So this is the problem. So uh, if this isn't about, uh, you know, sort of willy waving, frankly, this is, this is, um, you, this is about a persistent commitment to the region. And if you're the US and you've got 10 carriers and you can have four concurrent carrier strike group deployments, fine. You can always have a carrier in the Sea of Japan, mm -hmm. Philippine Sea, um, fine. But we're not that, neither are the French. So I think what, where we need to land is 
we have episodic deployments to the region where we don't go down there and just see if we can cause as much trouble as possible and then sprint home to Europe. We go down, contribute sensibly and pragmatically to the regional security situation, develop the interoperability we have with the US Navy uh, and the US Air Force in the Pacific. And in the years when we're not there with our carrier strike group, we're there alongside the French or we're there alongside the Americans. Uh, not with a carrier, but just with escort ships as part of your or the French carrier deployments. So, so the, the presence of the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, the British Army, it doesn't become the noteworthy and the exceptional, the kind of <laughs> carrier strike group 21. It is just the Brits are here again. That's what the Brits do. Okay, so we're running out of time. I want to ask you one last question that we have um, some interest from the audience, but also I wanted to hit on, you know, and it, it's a topic we focus on here for the United States, the alignment of resources to support your strategy. And there had obviously been talk of a big boost to defense up to 3%, and that doesn't seem to be on the table anymore. Do you think you're going to uh, get the resources that you need to actually support the integrated review refresh, given this more sort of concerning international environment? I hope so. <laughs> that is concise. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you, Minister, so much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, I hope you have a great afternoon.